Hey everybody, so today I'll be going over chapter 26, which is the start of time period eight and the start of the Cold War. So where we left off before your last test, we dropped the bombs on Japan, war is over. Now we immediately transition into what we call the Cold War, which is just this decades long struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. So let's get started. After the war, everyone is fearful that we're gonna go right back into the depression. There's fear about the economy, what's gonna happen when the war is over. Also, there are all these troops coming back from war and we don't know where they're gonna work. Um, so the GI Bill is passed. There are several red terms throughout here. So remember that just means you wanna make sure you know those. Um, this provides education so that they can go to school when they return. Not only does it ease the burden on finding jobs for all of these men who are coming back, but also it's gonna help in the long run because we're gonna have a better educated workforce. It boosts the economy. Um, they also allow for low interest loans for homes for these troops who are coming back. So the GI Bill is a really positive thing uh, as we get into the 1950s for helping these soldiers who are coming back from the war. So we enter this decades long prosperity in the United States. So in 1948, about three years after the war, the GDP of the United States goes up and stays up for like 20 years. There's just this amazing economic growth. When you picture the 1950s, you just think of like the family around the TV with all their appliances, uh, cars, TVs, suburbs are coming. So this is that growth that's gonna come after World War II. <clears throat> Women, we talked about during World War II that a lot of women went to work to fill the factory jobs of men who had gone to fight. After the men return home, a lot of these women are expected to just go back into the home. But this is a permanent shift after World War II. About a third of married women will continue to work outside the home, but of course they'll have to challenge that 1950s view of the American housewife um, and part of this is where we see the beginnings of the feminist movement. Women who don't think they should have to fit this mold of the perfect little American housewife. So we'll get to more of that in the 1960s. Baby boom, sure you've heard of this. So 45 to 57, we call these the baby boomers who lately, uh, okay boomer is what they get called. Um, but these people are still around. It's a whole generation that after World War II, there's just this surge in births. Partly, yes, due to men coming home from war, they miss their wives, that whole part that you've always heard. But also think about before World War II was the Great Depression. People were not having kids. So if they had waited to have children after World War II, now the economy is good. People have jobs and can afford to have children. That's another reason for this. As they get older, it mentioned this in the textbook, like as these babies grow into kids and then to teenagers and then adults they create just like this wave in different <clears throat> sorry different markets in society so in the 50s they're all buying a bunch of toys in the 60s these are going to be the rock and roll kids the hippies uh, as we get into the anti-war movement all of that now these people are retirement age or older uh, they're taking social security putting strains on systems like that and so it's interesting to watch just the effect they have as they got older going through American society. Also, after the war, we see this <clears throat> rush to the suburbs. Part of the reason is these home loans that were given to veterans returning from the war. Another reason is highways. It makes it easier to live outside of the city to go back and forth for work. Levitt towns, these are the names of those little cookie cutter houses. Uh, they built these quickly, efficiently, um, and they could get a lot of people living in them uh, fairly easily. The downside of this is we see what we call white flight, which is just what it sounds like. The white people from the cities flee the cities to the suburbs. In response, businesses tend to follow. That leaves these inner cities impoverished, racially divided, and part of that was intentional. Um, these FHA loans, a lot of times in the early years, 50s and 60s, would deny loans in these suburbs to African Americans and people of color. So it's not like it just kind of happens this way. Some of this was intentional to where the whites are able to move out to the suburbs, inner cities become 
public housing programs even more impoverished and racially divided. And we'll talk more about the effects of that, but that's where it begins is here. <coughs> Sorry. We also see a population shift to the Sun Belt, which includes Arkansas. We're right here. So the smiling Sun Belt, it's like a smile on the bottom half. After the war, people are going to start to move for the next several decades to the Sun Belt. <clears throat> Stretches from Virginia to California. This area sees massive population growth for several reasons. One is going to be defense spending for the Cold War. Many of these places who are building things related to the Cold War, think like NASA in Houston, uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida, more defense industries in California. That's where the money is going to be. So people are going to move there. Jobs, climate, it's warmer, lower taxes, all of those motivate people to move to those places. Because of this, <clears throat> really for the first time in American history, influence is slipping from the North. So from 1964 to 2008, every elected American president came from the Sun Belt. If you think about how much influence and power these states are going to start to have, including Bill Clinton from Arkansas, um, that's part of the reason for that, is because the Sun Belt is gaining such uh, prominence. So Truman, Harry Truman, I like to think of him like Scrappy-Doo. If you've ever watched the Scooby-Doo cartoons, like he's little, but he's fierce. He's not afraid um, of Stalin or standing up to the Soviet Union. So he's not college educated. He comes from Missouri, Kansas City, where in his past he has had some dealings with the mafia. Those were his associates that were questionable. And he's small and he's meek, but he's bold. Um, he made the decision to drop the nuclear bombs that ended World War II. He's going to take a strong stance against <clears throat> Stalin and the Soviet Union, even when other people wouldn't. So don't underestimate Truman. His domestic policy, there's not a whole lot here. Um, I'd say that Taft-Hartley Act is the most important thing. Really, a lot of his stuff that he tries to do at home is overshadowed by the Cold War and the arms race and all of that with the Soviet Union. <coughs> Excuse me. One important one is the Taft-Hartley Act. This is going to decrease the power of unions. Really, after World War II, we see a permanent decline in union membership, rights of unions that is still really downward trending now. In the area of civil rights, so pretty soon we're going to get to the civil rights movement in the 1960s, really late 50s too. He is the first to really use his power to challenge racial discrimination. One major thing Truman did is he ends segregation in the military and federal government. So after World War II, armed forces are no longer separated by race. They are integrated because of him. So that was a good thing. <clears throat> In 1948, he runs against Dewey. That's him right there. The Democrats end up splitting. So we have Truman. There's a really, it's like the uh, racist party called the Dixiecrats. <laughs> Uh, headed by Strom Thurmond, and then Henry Wallace is a new wing called the Progressive Party. So in the past, when this has happened, when a party splits, the other party wins. Everyone assumed Dewey was going to win this. Even the newspapers had already printed the papers that said Dewey defeats Truman, and here he is holding it after he actually won. So somehow Truman manages to pull off a victory. His domestic program he implements is called the Fair Deal. <clears throat> Sorry, he, like I mentioned before, he doesn't get a whole lot accomplished just because he's dealing with the Cold War, and that really overshadows a lot of his domestic programs. So <clears throat> to get into the Cold War, the beginning of we have to rewind just a little bit. So rewind to when FDR was still alive. The Yalta Conference is in February, so the war is going to end in May. This is a few months before that. Stalin promises, the leader of the Soviet Union, right here, Free elections for Poland. So remember, Poland had been taken over by Germany. By this point, had been liberated by the Soviet Union. He promises that I'm not going to take over Poland. I will let them have free elections. In response, Roosevelt is seeking Soviet help against Japan. Because remember, we're still fighting Japan on the other side of the world at this point. Intentions are high. So this is going to be setting up the post-war issues that we're going to have because he does not allow Poland to be free 
and he takes a lot of these nations called buffer states and just puts them under Soviet control, and that's not going to be good. So there's mistrust. <clears throat> the main thing dividing us and the Soviet Union all throughout the Cold War is the type of economic system we think the whole world should operate under. So obviously the United States is capitalist, Soviet Union is communist. Other things, Stalin's mad that it took his allies, <clears throat> Britain and America, way too long to open a second front, which was D-Day in France. He's also upset because he doesn't want to get invaded from the West anymore, like he has several times now, like from Germany. So he wants a buffer zone, this sphere of influence, basically countries that are under Soviet control that he can use to block the Soviet Union from the rest of Europe. Some ways they're similar. The United States and the Soviet Union were both isolationists. Remember, we tried really hard to stay out of both world wars. Both want to spread ideologies around the world. After Hitler is gone, that is like the glue holding the United States and the Soviet Union together, our mutual enemy. Once he is gone and the war in Europe is over, we immediately start opposing the spread of communism and that becomes the Cold War. When you hear war, you think like fighting or battles, that is not the case. This is a decades long ideological struggle that will involve some shooting and things like that, but it's going to go until the 1990s. So it's going to be several decades of just tension between the Soviet Union and the United States. After World War II, it is very different. If you ever got a question about compare the US role in the world after World War I, which was kind of like our time right, and after World War II, they're very different. So after World War I, we stick our head in the sand and hide, don't join the League of Nations. After World War II, it's the opposite. We're like, hello world, here we are. So International Monetary Fund, which sets up the World Bank, we become a leader in that. We become a leader in the UN, the United Nations, which is like the new version of the League of Nations. At this first meeting in San Francisco, there are talks and things proposed that would outlaw atomic weapons. Sadly, they fail. And this is going to set up that decades long arms race where us and the Soviets and eventually others are going to just be having this race to see who can build the biggest, baddest bomb to freak the other side out. So we had a chance to deal with it here, but we didn't. So now it's going to escalate into all this testing of atomic weapons. In Germany, <clears throat> there are many Nazi leaders who are convicted of war crimes at these Nuremberg trials. Now the question becomes, what do we do with Germany? So we've conquered it, now what do we do? So there's various schools of thought on what we should have done with Germany. The Hitler haters just want to reduce it to nothing, make it into something totally different, don't even let it exist anymore. The Soviets want to milk it of its money and resources to help them rebuild, whereas the US and some of our allies in Western Europe want to rebuild Germany so that it can help rebuild the rest of Western Europe, that it would help its neighbors if we rebuild Germany. So it is divided. I have a map to show you here in a second. So it's divided in half. We have East Germany and West Germany. Eastern Germany becomes its own independent country. Um, I think I have this backwards. Sorry, flip that. Western Germany becomes an independent country, democratically run. East Germany, ignore what's on here, flip flop those, becomes a Soviet satellite nation. So East Germany is Soviet, it's communist, run by the Soviets. West Germany is democratic. Churchill gives this famous speech in Missouri, actually, not too far from here, about how an iron curtain has descended across Europe. That would be this white line. It's not an actual curtain or a wall. He's just saying, if you look at this map, everything in red is the Soviet Union and their satellite states, it's communist. Everything blue is democratic, and we're trying to keep this line from spreading, keep communism contained, which is going to be our whole goal. So our official policy is called containment, which is just what it sounds like. We don't want communism to spread. We're going to do everything we can to keep that from happening. Truman comes out with his Truman Doctrine, which is basically containment, where we're going to support people. We're going to send as much money as we need to and troops, if needed, to keep communism from spreading. 
So the first place we do that is Greece and Turkey, $400 million. Uh, Western Europe, because it is war-torn, is under the threat of turning to communism. So in order to prevent that, we pour billions of dollars into Western Europe. So 16 nations total, you can see on this, the higher the stack of dollar signs is how much money they got. So France, Great Britain got the most, but there are hundreds of millions of dollars being poured into all of these countries. And it helps, it helps revive their economies, help them to rebuild from the war. And that's one advantage the US had that Europe did not, is we were not physically harmed as far as our country itself by World War II, other than Pearl Harbor. All the fighting took place over there. So they're the ones having to rebuild. Also, this seems unrelated, but it will be very important later. Truman recognizes Israel as an independent nation, which will greatly complicate our relationship with the Arab world. And we are still dealing with the fallout from some of this, but we'll get to more of that later. I just wanted to mention it. Another important event, there's tons of red terms. This stuff's really big in this chapter. Uh, 1948, so here's Germany. It's divided into four sections. So like all the winners of the war got a piece. So Britain, French, American, Soviet. Berlin, which is the capital of Germany, is this little colorful part right there. So this is like a zoom in on that. Here's the city of Berlin. It is also divided into four sections, which seems confusing because it is. Uh, so French, British, American, Soviet. So we have East Berlin, which is under Soviet control. West Berlin is all these democratic countries that combine our sections into democratic West Berlin. The problem is, if you look at this map, the whole city is surrounded by the Soviet zone. So what the Soviets do is they block off entrance into the western part of the city, hoping the people there will starve into submission and the Americans, British, and French will have to give up their control um, and let all of Berlin go to the Soviets. That's, that's the blockade. They block it off. In order to get food and supplies to the people, hopefully you read about this in AMSCO, it's called the Berlin Airlift. So for almost a year, around the clock flights are bringing food and supplies to the people of West Berlin to keep them from starving during the blockade. Um, and we don't surrender West Berlin. So after 11 months, Stalin says, okay, forget it, gives up on the blockade. So the airlift was a success. It's just amazing how many tons and tons of food and supplies were flown into West Berlin over the blockade of the roads that were on the ground. <clears throat> So this is where things start to heat up as far as when we think of the Cold War, it's like this arms race uh, and spies and espionage. We passed the National Security Act. So this establishes the DOD, the Department of Defense. Uh, that creates the National Security Council, the CIA. We start sending spies abroad. We know there are Soviet spies operating in the US. We also join NATO, which is gonna be really important, a North Atlantic Treaty Organization which initially is 12 countries, all these in blue. By the mid 50s, there will be 15. The Soviets also create their own mutual defense club called the Warsaw Pact, which is basically just them and their satellite nations. But all of these countries agree, if one of us gets attacked, we'll all be in this together. So if the Soviets attack, I don't know, Poland, or no, they got Poland. If the Soviets attack France, for example, here's France right there. Um, the United States, Canada, Great Britain would all come to their mutual aid. So that is the point of NATO. And our role in that has changed in recent years, but we are still part technically of NATO. In Asia, uh, we're gonna talk about Japan and China to finish up. Oh, one thing happens, this is important. So we had the atomic bomb first. The Soviets figure out how to create an atomic bomb. And we're like, well, crap, that's not good for us. So Truman says, how about this? We make a hydrogen bomb, which is four times more powerful than the atomic bomb. We test it in the early 50s and 52, and it works. A year later, the Soviets make a hydrogen bomb. So this begins that arms race where we're just trying to outdo each other and make the bigger, scarier weapon to threaten the other side with. Japan, after World War II, they have surrendered. 
They have a democratic government that Douglas MacArthur, the general from World War II and Korea, is basically going to set up and they cooperate very well. Um, so they do pretty well under this new government. China, however, falls into a civil war. Uh, Mao Zedong, who's the leader of the communists, defeats the Nationalist Party of Chiang Kai-shek. So China becomes communist. This is scary to Americans because our whole policy is containment and this massive country with a huge population just became communist. That's not good. So Americans, some, um, start claiming that our government is infiltrated with communism, that we allowed China to fall to communism, that they're everywhere. And this will bring us into that second red scare that we'll get to in just a second. Korea, so this is the Korean War. It is short, but significant. It is like the first actual shooting that happens as a part of the Cold War. So after World War II, North Korea belongs to the Soviets. South Korea belongs to the US, so we just split it. It was taken over by Japan. When Japan is defeated, both of us were winners of the war, so we just divided in half for the time being. June of 1950, the Soviet section of Korea, communist section, invades South Korea, thinking that we would just let go of our claims and just let it be kind of like with Berlin. We just let it go. It doesn't happen. Truman says, okay, uh, the communists are trying to spread. Our whole policy is containment. So let's go contain. Let's push back against the communist threat. We greatly increase our defense spending. This is a document, National Security Council 68, where we're building up massively our defenses, preparing for Cold War fighting. The UN decides to condemn North Korea as the aggressor. Truman sends a joint UN force uh, to South Korea, led by MacArthur, to try to push back against the North this way. So what ends up happening, here's the map. MacArthur pushes North, has this great campaign into Incheon. They start pushing him back. Then we get close to China, which is communist. And you can see from this, 300,000 Chinese troops pour across the border and this is not good. Um, so they run the UN forces, mainly US forces, back toward the South. MacArthur wants to take drastic action. He even proposed like nuking China, bombing China, invading China in response to this. Truman says no. MacArthur won't let it go, is speaking out publicly against the president, his boss, ends up getting fired by President Truman. And this is a huge deal. This guy is a war hero from World War II, and now from the Korean War, and he just gets fired by Truman. So he comes back. A lot of people side with MacArthur on this, but either way, uh, that's the end of his career as a general in Korea. So back home, it's the last part. We have what we call the second Red Scare. So the first Red Scare was in the 1920s, right after World War I. This one is in the 50s, right after World War II, where we are fearful that there are communists either from the Soviet Union or American born, who are infiltrating our society. So this loyalty review board is created where they interview thousands of federal employees to try to figure out if they're communist or not. Most of them are not, but this paranoia is real. House and American Activities Committee called HUAC. This is where young Richard Nixon, who we will talk about later, uh, gets his start in a prominent case of this guy, Alger Hiss who was a State Department official, who they try to prove has ties to communism. Uh, really, they get him on perjury eventually, but it doesn't matter. It's just these high profile, there's communists in the government uh, paranoia that's going on. Another example, the Rosenbergs. So this one, they probably did actually do it. They stole atomic secrets about the Manhattan Project and gave them to the Soviet Union so that they could build a bomb. They end up being executed for sedition. Again, it brings controversy because they have young children. Um, it doesn't sit well with a lot of people that they were killed for doing this. But either way, it's part of that second red scare, further proof for some people that there's this communist uh, underground ring working in the United States. Last but not least, we have this wonderful fellow. Joseph McCarthy is a senator from Wisconsin. He comes out and claims that he has 205 known communists in the State Department. 
He did not. He made this up. I think he just pulled 205 out of the air. He does not. But it doesn't matter. People start listening to him. He goes on this witch hunt. We call this McCarthyism, that he's accusing all these people. He's ruining people's lives by claiming that they're communist and they have some communist tie when they don't. His fatal mistake comes when he attacks the army. These are aired on TV. So it's called the Army McCarthy hearings where he's accusing the United States Army uh, of being infiltrated with communists and goes after all these people. People finally see on TV and these hearings what a jerk he is um, and how he's really unfounded in his claims that there's all these communists. So he loses a ton of support after these hearings. This is a famous line. It's a guy named Welch says, have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? You may have heard that before. That's from the Army McCarthy hearings. So he ends up not being reelected um, and dies just a few years after that happens. So doesn't end well for McCarthy. So that is it for chapter 26, start of the Cold War. Moving forward, we're gonna get into some really good stuff, uh, Vietnam War, 60s, civil rights, all of that. So let me know if you have any questions and I hope y'all have a great day.